Oh, Nancy, if you're ready. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to the framing seminar. Nancy, just before you get started here, I just wanted, um, is, is there anything that you need for me to do during this? Uh, I guess just record it. Also, you guys, if you have questions for Nancy, send them to me in the chat. Okay, so that um, I, I'm watching those. It's very hard to watch that when you're actually presenting. So I'm, I'm going to be doing that. So I will ask questions and I'll be watching the chat along the way. Yeah, so, so Mary, Mary's is gonna be, we're gonna discuss Mary's first so she can just relax and be the uh, moderator of this. So um, I, I have them lined up according to um, the number in which, or the order in which they came in, but I'm gonna just pop Mary's to the front so we can, first but because i'm so nervous <laughs> <laughs> so, all right so anyway nancy thank you so much for doing this and for ron i know that he'll be here and um everybody i have just been privy to uh we did a little, quick little walk through yesterday and um got handouts that you'll be getting later and this is way more than we asked for so nancy thank you so much for doing that and now we will turn this over to you I just wanted to share with you the tools that you'll need if you're doing your own framing, especially if you're participating in any plein air groups um, or plein air events uh, or quick paint or whatever. You, you have to have tools at the ready because uh, they sound the horn, you paint for anywhere from uh, Hold on. Put it on the easel for the judge to um, make the round. So everything is very fast and you have to be prepared. So I keep my tools in a, a box in my, um, in the back of my van so I can just easily, you know, get this together. And then you have to run with your easel and the frame piece to the lineup and get your work in. So it's, you know, your, your stomach's in a knot and once you get it all done, then you can kind of relax. But if you're working in watercolor or a uh, pastel or an oil panel, you need a point driver. And this just shoots points into the back of a frame like this. It shoots it in. And so make sure you have this and make sure you have an extra batch of the points because if you run out of points, then you can't use this thing at all. Um, so this is how work is presented at a a quick draw event. It's it's unfinished because they put a stamp to indicate when you presented your panel because you have to start with a blank canvas. So there's usually a stamp here and then you just put everything in. You don't finish it like uh, we ordinarily finish artwork on the back with paper and a hanger and wire so that it, it looks ready to go to a customer. But for quick draw, you just, it's just fast and dirty and you just get it done. Okay, and then you also need a, um, a screwdriver that's charged. So make sure your battery's charged or have a charger with you. And then you have to have a uh, wire and you don't need this heavy, heavy spool of wire. This just happens to be what we use in our store. So you can buy small spools of wire to have. Make sure you have enough wire. Um, if you're doing the quick draw, you can already have the, the piece uh, wired and then just slip your, your panel in. But if you're doing a, a lot of pieces over uh, the extended period of a planner event, you're going to need quite a bit of the wire. And then um, you need offset clips of different depths if you're, if you're using a canvas, stretch canvas, because this has to go over the back of the canvas and screw into the frame. And also need a couple of different types of stuff. These are D-rings, and that's what the wire do. Is there a question? No. Oh, that's my okay, um, so your wire goes into the D-ring hangers. These are attached to the back of the frame, like this. And uh, wire cutters, box cutter in case you have to trim off a little bit of your panel to make it fit in the frame. So just be prepared. Uh, painter's tape is good to have on hand. So I think Mary's prepared a list of these items that I'm suggesting that you, you stock and carry with you. 
Um, so I think that'll be coming out afterwards. And Nancy, there's a question about um, you know choosing offset clips. How do you decide what size? Well, you need a variety of sizes because, um, for example, people were telling me that they had stretch canvases for these frames, and they had to tell me the the depth of the canvas so I would know what what depth of frame to pick. So there's just you know so many different choices. Um, you know, sometimes it's just a little small reveal or a small stretcher bar. Other times it's um, more normal size. Then sometimes there are the deep gallery frames. So you need a really deep um, offset clip. So just but getting you, the- You can plan to buy those before you go out, as long as you know what size frame you are taking with you and what size canvas you're taking. In. Right, right. Because you don't want, um, the artwork to stick out from the back of the frame. You should have a frame that's deep enough to accommodate the stretcher bars. Um, if, if somebody hangs it on the wall of a room that you walk into, you can see behind the artwork and you want to avoid that. It needs to be flush or even inside the frame a bit so that the frame touches the wall. So for example, I used a frame that I had for this piece just because I liked the, the way it looked, but it sticks out from the back and that's not, not good. And you know, I've, I've done it because I, even though I'm in the business, sometimes I just have to use frames I have on hand. So um, just try to make sure that what you're painting on fits inside the frame. Okay. Um, one other question, do you, do you do anything else like add your cards to the back or anything else that um, you prepare it for the quick, quick paint? So uh, I do a, like a 10 day invitational plein air event in Florida and I take 30, 25 or 30 frames, both for oil and pastel. The, the ones that um, I take for pastel have glass and spacers or uh, a linen liner, then the glass, then the frame, because you want the, the glass to be away from the pastel. Um, same could be true for watercolor. If you worked in watercolor, I don't, but a lot of people do at these plein air events. You just don't want the glass to touch the, the artwork. So, um, oh gosh, what was I gonna say? So, oh, I- Yes, you I, have cards, yeah. I, I partner up the, um, panels with the frames because I'm, I'm kind of using frames that I have on hand um, just because we have so many frames. So um, often they're odd sizes, like maybe uh, we misordered something and so I'll make a panel to fit that frame. Uh, they're not always standard sizes. Um, some of the big planner events will have a frame vendor there and they will sell ready-made sizes, but if you have a frame that's a little off, you just have to make a, a stretch a canvas or make a panel to fit that frame. And so I'm always thinking about, um, and I always have my card on the back. I, I never know which direction I'm gonna paint. So I just kind of slap it on kind of haphazardly because it, you know, what I think might be a horizontal could be a vertical when I'm out there in the field. So, um, and then I always, sign the back and put the title on the back and the size and um, you know they stamp it too when you bring it in so um, but I, I do try to think about the frame as I'm painting the piece because you want the the patina or the feel of the frame to go with the artwork um, like I don't take a lot of flashy gold frames or um, metallic looking frames to Florida because it's it's so rugged and natural and so a lot of wood works well. Um, black frames are kind of hard because there's not a lot of black in Florida. You know it's it's very sandy and um, a little more high key because there's lots of sun. So I, I save the black frames for more urban urban scenes or 
or paintings that I do use black in. So be careful with the black paintings because they can, or black frames because they can overwhelm your paintings. And, and Nancy, another thought um, is, is uh, when you're doing that, if you take a frame of color, um, with color, um, do you then think about that for your painting? Do you actually? Um, you know, I have, I'll have such a big supply of frames in the back of the van, I'll, and I choose a spot, I'll think, now which frame and panel would work best with what I want to paint? So um, it, it works out really well. And then the, the next uh, follow-up question that came in was, um, is do the judges, the, how much do frames pr um, make a difference for the judges? Uh, well, being a judge, I like to say, we don't look that much at the frame, but if the frame's really bad, <laughs> it, it just, it diminishes the, the work a lot. It, it looks um, like the artist isn't prepared isn't being real professional. So that it kind of does factor in. Um, and it, a frame can kind of kill a piece or it can really enhance it. So you just, you have to keep it in mind and be careful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So let's see, I made a few notes here. Let me make sure I've covered things. Um, Oh, and I wanted to tell you that we've, because of you paying $15 for this um, event, we've raised almost $400 for the education fund for our group. So like the I Heart um, Plein Air event we had at Newberry, you know, we have to pay rent and um, there's lots of expenses for things like that. So this will go a long way to help make that happen again. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And um, I've been framing for 40 years. I started this business when I was uh, a student in college, a painting student, because I knew I'd be painting all my life. And um, we have framed almost anything you can imagine. So um, later, if you have questions about framing some oddball thing, I can answer that. So um, feel free. And um, also, a few of you need glass for your work if you're working in watercolor or in pastel you must protect the work with glass we sell four different kinds of glass we also have acrylic and so forth um, acrylic doesn't work with pastel because of the static electricity um, we have regular glass which i don't recommend for original artwork it's fine for prints but for original artwork you need something that that really showcases the work so for pastels, if you use a good sturdy substrate, I use mounted um, pastel paper for my work. Um, you don't have to worry about the paper being compromised by light. So I use anti-reflective glass. It's, it's not the old non-glare glass that's fuzzy. It's, it looks like museum glass, it kind of disappears. It doesn't have the added expense of UV protection because your, the paper is not going to be compromised because it's mounted and, and very stable. And the pastels don't fade because they're pure pigment. Um, with watercolor, you do need the UV protection um, because watercolors can fade. So there's a conservation clear glass that is regular glass, but it has the same amount of protection as museum. It just has the glare that you get with regular glass, but it will protect your work. And then you can jump to museum glass. Um, there's a little bit of, a little more UV protection in Plexi. You can use Plexi on watercolor. Um, and then there's a very, very top of the line Plexi that's more expensive than museum glass. But um, I, I think we've only used that a couple of times in my 40 years and it's, it's a fairly new product, but it's just so expensive that museums use it. So, um, and hopefully, some of us will get to that point someday. <laughs> so um, let's see, we're gonna do Mary first because she needs to be free to be the, the boss. <laughs> so I've put all of our pieces on the iPad. Can everybody see that? It's not a good image, but I, I can see it very well looking at it directly, but I think the trans from <laughs> iPad to iPad is just not very good. Okay, so um, 
again, there's there's no black in Mary's piece, so I would stay away from the black frame. Um, and again, I'm looking at a printout of an image that she sent via email, so I'm not getting a, a true reading as if the the artwork was here with me. But I selected pieces that I thought look very nice. This is a has a nice wood grain mm -hmm. texture. You can yeah. see that. And this is I, I did from very inexpensive on up. So this would be a, a nice inexpensive way to handle it. Mm -hmm. And again texture and brings out some of the warmth in the, the grasses. And then this one is a little dressier, a little more upscale. Um, it has like a fillet that's that's built into the frame and again some textural wood here. Yeah. So it's a little more of a presentation than the than the narrow one. I would go with that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't have to choose. And if anybody's interested in any of the, the selections I've made, um, I didn't I didn't price these out or anything. So um, just contact me later and say, you know, ask for the price of all three, I'll be happy to do that. Or come in and we can look at the hundreds that we have. And they're asking if you could bring the uh, last frame up closer to the camera. So it, it has a, a nice modeled gold built-in fillet, and then it has the wood feel. Mm -hmm. Great. Is Barbara Herring still there? Uh, she was having trouble getting on. Yeah, I... but I'm here now. I'm here now. All right. Okay. Barbara has to do Mary a... sent me a link. Okay, she has to do a Zoom funeral today at two. So oh. let's do her now. Memorial. <laughs> Has to go. Okay. 1418 oil on panel. So uh, we don't have to worry about depth with the uh, substrate because she has a thin panel. You have a lot of black in here and you have a lot of property. So I chose this black that's soft with the coppery edges. Or this model silver because you have a lot of modeled gray in here. And then I know you like a thinner frame. So here's this one in the thin version. Let's see, is there a name for that particular frame if you're going to drop in your shop to request it? The, which one? The uh, black, uh, the black one. It's either one or a lot. So we have it right under the, the counter here. Um, just say black with copper. <laughs> and oh, we'll okay. Thank you. And, and I heard somebody snapping photos. That's a great way to um, just bring in that photo if you see a frame you like and we can go right to it. So, okay. So these are for Anne. Um, there's such a difference between the iPad and the printout. Okay, so she has this beautiful brass pitcher. So I was pulling the brass and thinking about this little touch of black. So again, the frame that Barbara liked with the gold and the touch of black on the back, I think really enhances that, that brass and the lemon or pear. The brass and the iPad looks cooler. So depending on what the original is truly like, um, I did pull the cooler silver, warm silver with the little touches of black on the edges. Mm -hmm. It's very warm in the actual painting. Is it? Oh. Mm -hmm. Very brass-like. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is this more gray than blue? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So this is, that's probably that's, closer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then again, a linen liner that has a creamy tone and this model gold. Mm -hmm. That was nice with it. And this is a 1620 oil. So, you know, we can go pretty large with the, the frame. And we do have all the, the ready-made plan air frames that we're all used to seeing. Um, I just, I didn't pull those because we're all so used to seeing those. I thought these might be a, you know, the more custom looks might be more interesting because maybe you're not as familiar with them. I have not seen those plain air. Right. Um, there, let me grab one. They're like, you know, like this finished corner, that kind of thing. They come in gold, silver, black. Does that look familiar? Okay, thanks. Yeah, those are the, the typical plein air frames that, that people use. And if, um, as far as cost, like if, I know some people go to Hobby Lobby or Joann's or Michael's and they have these 60% off coupons for custom frames. We're actually less than they are for custom framing with their 60% off. But you can buy, if you, if you paint um, a standard size, you can buy their, their frames off the shelf. And those are less expensive than what we can offer. But um, just keep in mind if you have custom framing needs that, that we can always beat their price. Okay, Anne, any questions? No, thanks. Thanks a lot. They're beautiful choices. That's a beautiful piece. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. This is... This is a 1216 oil on panel, so again, we don't have to worry about depth. And, you know, it's very natural scene, so um, I, I brought a natural slate that I thought was nice with some of these dark suit here. It has a little texture. It's, it's kind of a blue, blue gray, hints of blue in there. And then an actual blue with some silver. And then I thought this was interesting. It's, it's metallic, which um, I don't often put metallic with natural seams, but it, it just pulls out all the color that's in there. It has a, um, mauve to pink to blue cast in the central area and then the warmth on either edge. Sue, do you have any questions? Is Sue there? Okay. I did have a question, I'm sorry. Oh, oh you are, okay. Fine. The question, you don't have to put it back up, but the question is, um, a lot of times you go out for plein air events, you can't take, I can't take 25 frames with me. Uh, so- That's for, that's for 10 days. Pardon? I, I'm, I'm doing that many paintings in 10 days, 25. Okay. Well, mine, I don't do that many. So uh, the question is though, if you have to figure out, and the, the painting I use is probably a good example. If you're doing landscapes predominantly, is is there a, a kind of a default, kind of the plein air frame you showed might have been a default uh, type of coloring to use, or at least one of a few to pick for plein air paintings if you need to stock them in advance and be prepared to take them and you really don't know what you're going to paint when you get there. Do you have a sense of that? Well, if you paint in a standard size, um, if you use a particular palette, like this is, these are mostly cool colors. So, you know, if you want to use one of those um, close corner standard plein air frames, I would go into the silver because you don't really have 
black here. I think black would be too harsh for this. Um, and yeah, because there's a lot of a lot of cool colors in that particular painting. Yeah. So I would I would lean more towards silver than probably. I think gold would be a, a mistake with this piece. What about natural browns? Yeah. Yeah. Natural. It's it's hard to find you know uh, a plein air frame in wood tones. The the typical plein air frames are black, silver, and gold. But there are ready mades that you can get at Michaels and Hobby yeah. Lobby that are have the wooden tones. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So this next one is a big guy. It's fifteen by thirty and. It's on an inch and three quarters canvas, which is really deep. It's deeper than this. This is inch and five eighths, I think. So I had to choose some deep frames. So this one would accommodate inch and three quarter stretcher bars. So it's, it's hard. It's going to cast such a shadow on this little piece. But I was pulling out the this, you know, charcoal color in the sky. And it, which, which is more accurate? Is it more the blue charcoal or? Yeah, it's more the blue. It's a oh. great, really wedgewoody blue sky. Okay, it might be, although that one's not deep enough. Yeah, you probably need something that has a little more of the, the slate blue in it. Um, but it is a challenge to find you know, frames deep enough for a canvas that that heavy. So keep that in mind, especially if you're if you're uh, trying to do it on the fly in a quick paint or something. It's it's um, it has special challenges. So um, these are these both accommodate an inch and three quarters, and they, these are called floater frames. So they fit you know behind the the canvas. And your canvas would come up close to the to the top. You don't want your canvas to extend out from a floater frame because the floater frame is protection. And if it ex extends out beyond, then your your painting is uh, very likely to get damaged around the edges or something. So is it okay if it's recessed beneath it? Then is that an okay look? Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I brought. I brought, uh, this is how we do it. We pre-drill on a, it's called a reveal frame. We pre-drill the re reveal frame and run screws into the back of the stretcher bars. And I always put a piece of cardboard in before the stretcher mm. bars are screwed in because it's a puncture protector. Good idea, yeah. yeah. You don't want, like even if you send a piece to a gallery and you don't have this protection, they might lean it against another piece and something could fall and come right through the front of your painting. So when you install a reveal frame on a painting, have little shims on each side that keep it in alignment. Otherwise you can get it, you know, like too much over here and too close over here. So make of equal shims to make that separation and then screw it in from the back. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Sure does, yeah. I like that look. Yeah, a lot of people do. It's it's real clean and so I thought I thought this golden color was pretty. It I I tended to pick from the paper. So I picked it for this, yeah. but it mm -hmm. might be too intense if this is closer to your your painting. Somewhere between the two. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you need to have the painting on hand to pick the frame. Mm -hmm. And then I want to pick um, a nice warm wood reveal. So again, does everybody understand about reveals? That the canvas stretcher goes inside and it's it's below the level of the face of the frame a little bit to protect the canvas. And then it's screwed in from the back. And um, 
someone asked about reveal frames if you worked on a panel and we have a solution for that and I, I'll show that in a bit. That's Virginia's, she's number nine, so we're not to number nine yet. <laughs> so we'll talk about that solution when we come to Virginia's. Thank you. Okay. Oh. This is Karen's. This is Ethiopia, right? Yes. So brilliant color. Wonderful piece. It's large, 31 by 38, three quarter inch canvas. So it's it's so um, rugged and earthy, and um, you know people are impoverished. So you don't want a glitzy frame on a piece like this. So I picked. This is kind of a a wormwood black. That was nice with it. If you just want to cap the piece, it doesn't have to be a wide frame because it, it is already large. And then this is a rustic gray, warm gray, which I thought brought out the, the hut. And then if you want something just clean and simple, a reveal, since it's a three quarter inch stretcher, he could just do a, a simple reveal, the painting. And that brings out the sand, sandy color and so forth. So you understand that you really only see this, right? That this is, this is mechanical back here. This is what you screw in through into the frame. You really only see about that much. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Nancy, you just said something that was um, a, a bit of an intrigue to me, and that is that um, when you mentioned Kuhn's painting that and about Ethiopia, that the people were impoverished and you didn't want something that was glitzy. Um, and so if we're painting to a story um, and thinking about a story, how does that, how much does that affect the I choice? I think that's important. Um, don't you agree that you know, a silver or gold frame on this would be, it'd be like draping her in diamonds, you know, <laughs> just, um, I think you just need to keep that in mind mm -hmm. to make the, to make the piece work as a whole. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, thank you. Somebody just asked a question that when your frame uh, painting is wet, are the edges marred if the frame is switched later? They can be. Yeah, they can be. Um, and in a quick paint, there's no way really around that. You might, when the quick paint is over after they've judged, you might want to pop it back out of the frame and, you know, fix those little edges that, that maybe got smushed and and clean off the edge of your frame too and and uh, also maybe kind of a related question but um, what happens when um, somebody wants to buy your picture that's in a frame that they don't like because it doesn't match their sofa <laughs> well, I always tell people that my work is priced with the frame of their choice included mm -hmm. so our our walls are covered with my pieces that we frame, but if somebody doesn't like the frame, I change it, but that's easy for me to do <laughs> because I have a frame job. So, um, you know, hopefully you've used a decent frame. Maybe you can reduce the price a little bit and keep the frame for your use later if they don't like the frame. Um, if you're working in pastel, that's a bit of an issue because you really need to have it protected to pass it along to someone. So um, if you can even pop it out of the frame and just run a bead of tape around the glass and, and give them the glass with the, the pastel just so they don't smear it. Um, yeah, I, 
I, I want to sell my work so badly that I'm very happy to change the frame. Does that answer the question? Um, it, it probably does. I think, you know, okay. uh, it, it's about, it's probably more about negotiating skills of artists. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least they like your painting. <laughs> you, know, so you can't get bummed, too bummed if they like your painting that much. Okay, so this is a case where the printout is really bad. I think this is probably closer to the original, correct? Who, whose is that? Uh, this is Edith's. Edith's. Because there's wonderful reds in here, this beautiful midnight blue, and it's all blah on this printout. So, so I did kind of try to, to look at both to pick the frames. Since it's a nocturne, I thought it was kind of fun to use that indigo blue linen liner and just keep it dark. Mm. And this is a, a kind of a metallic frame, but it has lots raise of raise your hand a little bit, Nancy. There you go. It's it's a little metallic, but it has a blue wash throughout. And I and it's architectural with these lines. So I thought it was nice. Uh, you know, there's lines here, lines on the awning. It just seemed to keep that nocturne feel. And then uh, again, a, a black frame works in this situation because there's a lot of real dark in here. And then a little gold or silver. You could use a silver uh, frame like this. Um, that could work. So black definitely works in that case. And then for a less expensive option, um, just this deep red, I think works. Not so much with this because if the reds faded out, but I think that's a good option. So Vita, do you have any questions? Um, do you put the black one back up with the gold? Yeah. Yeah, that and the one with the blue linen liner is really interesting. I don't think I've ever seen a frame like that. This one? Uh, or, with the blue linen liner? Yeah, was, it's, it's, we have a, a lot of liners in different, mostly they're oatmeal or, or white or cream, but we have a, just a few that are in color and occasionally they work. So that just keeps the keep the mood going. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Nancy, do you keep in stock uh, standard sizes, uh, nine by twelve, twelve by sixteen linen liners? Yeah, too much. Um, we don't have any storage, and our shop is full. Um, so we can get get things very quickly we can seven vendors that we get deliveries and shipments and things from on an almost daily basis but so, if somebody wanted to uh you know think about a liner as part of their paintings that they take out i mean their uh quick paints or anything would that make sense or are they too hard to use that way oh no it's just it's another little frame that just goes inside the outer frame mm -hmm. so you can have it all prepared and all you have to do is just pop your work into it you know, at your quick paint. Just mm -hmm. have it, you know, it's just an extension of the frame. Mm -hmm. And we have many, many boards of different widths of linen liners and different colors. So we also have fillets, uh, which they can fit inside the lip of a frame or the lip of a mat. And I have one example I'm gonna show you with a watercolor, how to use a fillet. And those can add an extra little um, touch of bling or um, interest. Um, and I use them sometimes if my linen liner is just a whisker too small for my outer frame, I'll put a fillet in there and um, that'll take up that gap. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so Pat did a pastel, nine by 12, and it's on paper. So when you paint on paper and it, it's not mounted, I, I suggest um, UV protection, just because the paper can be susceptible to deterioration from light. Um, the pastels don't really fade, but the paper can be compromised. So keep that in mind. Um, you can pre-mount your paper with, um, I have a dry mount press because of my situation, but, and I dry mount all my pastel paper, but you can um, use 3M spray. It's a, a green can, get it at the hardware store and you just spray it on your surface and then lay your, your pastel paper or watercolor paper down and uh, it, it works great. So Pat asked for um, inexpensive um, options. So this liner is a very inexpensive liner and you can pair it with lots of different things. I thought this was really nice with the, the gray tones that she has in the piece. Um, it's just a a gray wooden frame that has some nice rubbing texture on it and then oatmeal liner. If she wants to bring out the grasses in the back that are more golden, this gold works, it's a model gold. And that's a very inexpensive option. And then I thought this was nice with it. It, it kind of has a grassy look, but it's a natural looking wood. And it has some darks in it that bring out the trees as well as the warmth of the grasses. Pat, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I was wondering about um, if you, the thing is, is it's pastel and I don't want the glass to be on top of it. Right. So should I use a ply mat or? Um, well, what you use, oh, you mean, uh, between, you mean to on that board? The, with, so with the paint, paint. use the linen liner instead of an eight ply mat board. So you can you can also mat a pastel, but I rarely rarely mat my pastels. I treat them as oil paintings when I frame them. So you you can use the linen liner, and again, these come in all different widths. Okay. Then you put the glass on and frame out here. So the linen liner serves as your spacer. Okay, okay. So I was a, thinking of an eight ply mat, but I kind of like that. Yeah. You can certainly do an eight ply mat, but um, mats can get a lot of pastel dust on them over time. And a linen liner. To, you know, if you if you move it around a lot, um, but it's it's very easy to to take it apart and just brush off the linen liner if you get some pastel in there. And then if you use this without a mat or without a liner, you put the glass next to the frame and then a Nancy, raise your hand. The glass goes next to the frame, and then there's a spacer that sticks to the glass and then your mounted pastel. What is a, a spacer? Um, can you grab a spacer from the book? They're back by the refrigerator. Um, it's a, a plastic little rectangular piece and it comes in four different depths. Um, <clears throat> it has an adhesive side, you just pull off the adhesive and the adhesive sticks to the glass. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Thank and you. Nancy, there's a there's a question here, kind of relatedly. I mean, I, we're going to see it here, but is there a cleaner you recommend if a little bit of wet paint gets on the liners? If oil paint gets on the liners? Yes. <laughs> it's it's hard to clean them. Um, I've over the years. Uh, 
it's a little easier to get pastel off liners with a, a white eraser, rubber eraser. Um, it's hard to get oil paint off a liner. Um, I've gone, I've taken them out in the yard and given them a spray of of uh, you know off-white paint to try to <laughs> cover that when I'm desperate. So um, you just have to be really careful to not get get it on the liner. So try to to use clean hands. Try to make sure your your liner is already in your frame if you're doing a quick paint. So that all you have to do is pop that painting into the package of the liner and frame. You're not handling the the liner too much with paint on your hands. So this is the spacer. There's the sticky side that attaches to the glass and you just score it, snap it off to the length you need. It fits down in that the rabbit of the frame and then your your pastel goes behind that. So that gives you space between glass and uh, your painting. Is that something that can be purchased? Yeah, they can be. I mean we we use them by the mile. <laughs> um, I I guess you could get them at Blick. I'm certain you could get them online, and we certainly sell it too. So um, I think you can get them, and they they do come in different depths. Um, so just whatever you you want. I I use. Um, This piece is a pastel with a deckled edge. And I used a really deep liner or spacer, I'm sorry, a white one. I, I guess you can't really see it, but um, it's kind of a fun, clean, contemporary look. But it's um, a half inch. Okay, Pat, are you good? Uh, do you, now did you say you spray it before you frame it, right? No, 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 I don't spray them at all. It's, the spray completely dulls the color and you have to repaint. Um, I, I have been experimenting with fixative in my studio, but the very first stages, when I, I put the darks on, you, you've taken one of my workshops, so you know I work dark to light. Yes. And I'll, I'll put the darks in, uh, not very heavily, and then I give it a squirt of um, fixative and then brush it in with the fan brush, kind of spread the darks around. And that's the only time I use a fixative. So it, it really does. After the fan brush or before the fan brush? It, that's what makes the fan brush work, is the, the liquid medium, whether it's alcohol oh. or... Um, Spectrum. Okay. So Nancy, I think you've done nine. Okay. So um, so you still have a little bit more than half to go. Okay. Uh, all right. So this thank is. You. What's that? I said thank you. Sure. Okay. So this is Virginia. She's number nine. And she was asking, she said her uh, client base likes the reveal frames and she works on an oil panel. So she doesn't have the wood to screw into to use a reveal frame. So she can use a low reveal. This is like a three step and she can run a bead of glue along here and glue a piece of cardboard or foam board or uh, even two thicknesses directly to that and then glue the panel on top of the foam board or cardboard. Does that make sense? So, so the foam board goes as the base of that on the, uh, and yeah. then on top of that yeah so the the foam board would be glued in tightly there mm -hmm. and then her painting would go on top 
of that and glued down. And she can build that up as high as she wants with cardboard or foam board. And gluing the panel to that, what do you still use that same adhesive? Yeah, uh, you could use liquid nails or um, that would dry quickly. Uh, a good wood glue would work. So that's, that's the real easy solution. Um, if she wants to use a um, front, if she wants to use a, a bigger reveal, um, you can glue the stretcher bars, excuse me, um, glue stretcher bars to the back of the painting. Raise, it, raise your hand. Oh, sorry. So first glue stretcher bars to the back of the painting. And, and stretcher and, bars are what? Stretcher bars are just these pine bars that we use for, um, to stretch canvas. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had another little one somewhere. Uh, it's all, all these guys that just, you know, you can stretch your canvas on. There's lots of different depths. But if you're working on a panel and you need to use a reveal frame, you need to, to drill into wood. You drill through here at the back of your frame. You drill into this that is glued to your panel. Does that make sense? So your your oil panel is glued to stretcher bars. Yeah. And then you screw the stretcher bars into your reveal frame. Good. So so you're the from the back, you can still see the the panel, except for where it's glued to the stretcher. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I've. This is you know, if if I didn't have the cardboard in here, you'd be able to see the back of the panel or the back of the canvas. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so I selected <clears throat> just this very very simple black because um, I thought if she needed a, just a simple solution to glue her piece in, she could directly into the frame, she could do that. If she wanted to use the stretcher bars, I picked this frame that has a little texture and a little warm rub on all the different layers. So you, you wanna use this level as your reveal part. So you, you don't wanna frame on that level, you wanna frame down here. So you get this nice even reveal all the way around. So that goes nicely with her piece. It looks real urban, it's real contemporary. And then I thought about the color of the L tracks. And I thought this warm gold was nice. There's just a little bit of gold, so it stays contemporary. Well, this is too deep, but anyway, just to reveal mm -hmm. that way. Another thing you can do if your edge is, and you want to introduce a little color and your edge is rough, you can cap the edge of your panel with a little skinny frame and then put that inside with your painting. So just, there's just a million options of combinations and so forth. So is there a way to remove the reveal board if you change frames? Just unscrew it? Yeah, just unscrew it from the back. Yeah, you can use your frames over and over again. So what if they get dinged? How do you uh, um, fix them? Uh, Sometimes you can use a, like a damp washcloth, put it over the ding and use an iron and just steam out the ding. Huh. Um, 
sometimes if there's a surface scratch, you can use a little steel wool, but you have to treat the whole frame with the steel wool. You can't just try to clean up an area. You have to kind of give it all the same rub. That'll take care of some scratches. Uh, markers work wonders. Uh, it just, it depends on how extensive the damage is. If, if it's a chunk, it's sometimes hard to fix. Um, we can repair a lot of frames. Uh, I've even repaired those real ornate ones that um, have like chunks of, of ornamentation gone. I make a plaster cast and put it back in and uh, you can leaf it and, and paint it gold. That's just very labor intensive, but but a lot of frames can be repaired. I, I just personally noticed um, that the markers, um, that the furniture repair markers are better than like um, Sharpie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. But yeah, there's oil in them that works into the wood better, I think, than Sharpies. So they're, they're kind of more for the surface. Okay, Virginia, anything? Any questions? She must not be here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let, let me just say though, thank you to Virginia because she's going to handle the recording of this and uh, oh, okay. she'll edit it. So thank you, Virginia. Great. Thank you, Virginia. So a barn subject in a landscape needs that kind of frame. So um, again, a gold or silver or black frame here would, would just not work at all. So I found some very rustic, natural looking frames. Um, this is a, a very good, inexpensive option for this. It's an 11 by 14, so it's not real big. It's oil panel. You don't have to worry about the depth. But this really brings out the color of the barn. Uh, we can add a linen liner if you want to dress it up a bit. But just a simple, inexpensive way to do it is with this kind of reddish, rustic barnwood look. This is truly a barnwood look. It, it's like it's you get a splinter from it. It's that rough. Um, so that's very casual. And then this is a more refined, I don't know if you got to see this. Um, this is a more refined barnwood feel, but it's it's a smoother finish, so it's a little little dressier. And I thought it was nice bringing out some of these darker tones in here. And whose is that? Kirsten's. Oh, Kirsten's, okay. Kirsten there. And are I, you adding mats between the art and the frame, or? Well, these are oils. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I haven't, I really haven't um, talked about mats yet at all, except with yours. Okay. And yours could, you could use a mat if you choose to. I, I don't mat my pastels, but a lot of people still do. It's, it's kind of uh, a thing of the past with pastels, but, but watercolors still use mats a lot. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, like a mat. But, but you know, oils unless they're oil on paper, you don't you don't mat them. You can use linen liners, you can stack frames, but you don't use a mat. Because if you if you introduce a paper mat, you need to put a piece of glass over that to protect the paper mat. So that's you know you don't typically put glass over an oil. Any questions on this one? Okay, that's Mary's. We did that. Okay, this is a very um, oops, intricate watercolor. And whose is this? Um, this is um, D O'Hare. Beautifully done. She really got the perspective down and amazing. So it's a uh, 15 by 21. It's on watercolor paper. So, again, no issues with depth. 
Um, and I chose two different mat looks. This is an eight ply rag mat, which is double thick. I don't know if you can see the bevel. It's just really a, a nice presentation with, um, with photos, with watercolors. It, it just gives it a nice extra look. And uh, let's see. There are lots of, lots of green tones in here and lots of grays. So everything, it's very, very textural. So the, the three frames I chose have texture, this one especially. And as does this one. And always, with a, if you use a mat, make sure that the ratio between frame and mat is varied. If you do the mat the same width as the frame, it's it's very redundant and boring. So you want to, you know, give it more mat than frame. If you use a wide frame and want to use a narrow mat, that's more acceptable. But but just make sure they're not the same width. So this picks up a lot of the color in here too. It's a little more polished, but I, I really liked the texture especially. And then I picked um, a green tone mat and I put a fillet with it that is also textural. I thought that was a nice finish around the edge of the mat. So if you use a fillet, the frame the outer frame needs to coordinate with it. So make sure that the patina in the fillet matches the patina of the frame. So those two work with it. Nancy, how does a, how does a fillet um, affect the lines in the, the artist's intent of lines in the painting. Uh, so the movement, uh, the eye movement into the painting and things, if, you know, just looking at that, that, that deep, uh, the darker uh, fillet, um, you see that as, um, and, and of course, we're not looking at how dark these lines are there, but does that make any difference that, that? I've, I've never considered that. You mean, does it stop the eye or? Yeah, does it, you know, it, yeah. You know, does, does it, like the artist wouldn't necessarily make a line around it, so I, I'm just oh, curious about I see. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I, I think as long as the fillet is uh, in color harmony with the artwork, you know, if you put a black fillet around there, it would definitely, your eye would go right to the fillet first. It wouldn't, you would look at the painting first it would be like a black line around but but this is there's a lot of uh, color cohesion here and it goes with the frame so it, it just I don't know steps it up a little bit but I, I think the a-ply mat does too so that's maybe a, a more uh, museum-like presentation to use the the, the plain uh, creamy a-ply mat versus this might be a little more decorative mm -hmm. What does it mean, eight ply? Are there other mats that are four ply or? Yeah, typical mats are four ply. This is a four ply. I don't know if you can see the difference on the screen, but the eight ply is just, whoops, double that. And it, it has a, a deep bevel. So it, it's just really a beautiful, elegant presentation. But it's hard for you to see. Then the, um, we have boards and boards of fillets too, um, but they can also be just attached inside a frame, you know, if you want an extra little touch. So they, they're pretty versatile. So Dee, do you have any questions?
you deep. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Wow. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I was going to say, um, yes, I, I thank you very much. I didn't know the difference between the 8-ply and the 4-ply. Sometimes I would do a double a mat of the same color even to try to get that depth. Uh, if you, and I, now I know I can do it just with an 8-ply. So that was really interesting to learn. And um, I know that when I can, I'm coming to your shop to help me um, with my matting and framing. So Good. <laughs> well, we do give artists 20% off the frame we have all the years we've been in business. So um, keep that in mind. <laughs> I, I definitely will, thank you. Uh -huh. This is such a beautiful soft piece. Let's see, where's his third? Okay. So this could be, because of the subject, could be uh, casual, but it has a, a real elegant feel. So I, I picked frames that went both directions. Um, there's such a glow. Can you see such a glow from this? Uh, is this Muriel's? Uh, this is William. Oh, Bill Marvin. Bill Marvin, yeah. So this frame has that glow. And Can can you see that? And it has all these colors. I can see it. A real mauve tone. Is everybody? It's beautiful with it. Very elegant and spot on as far as the color. And this is a modeled silver that I thought was. Oh, this piece is a 12 by 18. I don't think I mentioned that. It's on a half inch board. So these would all accommodate half inch board. And then this is a much more casual look. It's kind of a blue gray um, rubbed. It's not really, but it, it's that rustic rubbed wood feel. And a lot of warm tones in it that go with the bird. So Bill, do you have any questions? Sorry, I muted him to get rid of the echo. Okay. You need to unmute yourself. That was number 12. We're halfway through. Are we doing okay on time? Uh, that's up to you. <laughs> yeah. We got to get Ron in here to talk to you. This is Tobin's. It's 11 by 14 oil on half inch canvas. So again, had to accommodate that. <clears throat> so there's a, this crisscross is clearly the attention getter. And so I, I brought this crisscross frame out. I don't know if you can see that because I just thought it was fun with it. And again, a linen liner, just a very thin one, white, because there's, this isn't creamy, it's, it's cool and white um, in the white area. So I thought the white was nice with it. I thought the crisscross was fun. It might be too busy for some, but I just, I liked it with it. And I like this black with it because the black's not right next to the piece, it has, gray which is nice with the background grays and then the black and because there's so much blue i found this kind of slate blue rubbed rustic piece so um this this is a very inexpensive option and would be a nice finish for his work so Mary asked me about, um, you know, like when you are hanging a show of your work, when, when you're in a group show, 
it's just a higgledy piggledy of all different kinds of frames and styles and color and so forth. But um, I I think it's most important to frame for the individual art piece rather than trying to have all your frames match. Um, even when people are doing a, a, you know a wall of photos at home, um, I try to get things that coordinate, but maybe not all the same frame. I think it's a little more interesting and you're you're suiting the piece better, the the uh, color harmony in the piece, the story in the piece, if you select the frame for that particular piece. And if, if it's your work, the, the style is gonna be similar, so you will have some continuity um, without having the frames all be the same. Any questions, Toby? Uh, no, that's very helpful, very creative. Oh, sorry, I forgot to flip you over there. <laughs> Nancy, I wanna comment on what you were just saying and, and um, uh, that that I in my head, I, ha I hear Nate Berkus, who is on like Oprah or somebody oh. like that, but saying, you know, your whole wall should be all the same frame, same color frame. Oh. Um, and uh, so I think there's people that are out there. Do you notice any difference in terms of like who comes into your like uh, of who comes into your store versus who is at for instance a competition you know are, are or maybe where there's more maybe another question would or another way to say it would be where there are more collectors versus you know people off the street is there any difference that way of what people want well i i would think that collectors are maybe a little more um, experienced with both their art purchases and their frame selection because they've probably been at it for a while. They've lived with the work. Uh, they they kind of know what they like and know what they want. Um, I, I think artists and, and I am totally guilty of it. I think we're always thinking about um, the cost, you know, and we've got to try to resell this thing. So we're investing in our time in the, creating it and then investing our money in the frame. So, you know, we can't afford to to go all out with the frame. I, I think the, the collector can, you know. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think it does. And, and the other thing is, it feels to me, you and I were talking about this yesterday, but it feels to me that as a, as you're thinking about the season, like for us as, as we go out, or even just thinking about a competition where you might be doing, uh, you know, five, eight, ten, or as you were saying, 30 <laughs> paintings, um, that you might think about your style and your, um, as you said, matching your frame to um, as you look at a scene that you would go pick the frame so that um, just as the as you begin to think about your palette that you're going to paint um, but also it, it feels to me that um, as you're thinking about a grouping of paintings that you might be pre even backing it up to think about how you're going to paint and what palette you're going to be using for that grouping so that you there is some cohesion in your paintings yeah yeah if you're doing a solo show you know when you hang the show um, pay attention to your subject and your color palette for the pieces as you probably lay them out on the floor or lean them up against the wall and and uh, you know if you do a lot of landscapes and then if you do a lot of uh, under the L pieces you know just make sure you group things according to the color and subject because you're your palette for a landscape is going to be different than your urban palette, I would think. And your frame choices for your landscape pieces might be more earthy and, and wood and natural. And then, you know, your urban pieces might be more sleek and uh, maybe black and, or, um, you know, something that, that the steel that goes with the buildings or whatever. So, um, yeah, there's just a lot to think about, you know, when you're making these choices. Okay, are we ready to move on? 
Yep. Eight. This is an oil by Liz Buckley. It's 9 by 12 and it's on a panel, so again, no depth issues. This is such a nice, soft painting. Um, it almost has a, a watercolor feel because she's gone high key. The, the background, it really pushes the, pushes into the distance, which is great. So it has a, a kind of a green patina overall. Um, it's the artist's two lions, if you can see, and then the green in the shrubs and a little green back here. So I, I pulled things that had green in them. Um, just a soft model green with a, a silver lip. I thought it was nice with it. Um, this is this is green with a bronze lip, just a cap for a canvas. And if, if you're working on a panel and you want to make it look like you've worked on a stretch canvas, just get a, a deeper frame and it looks like it's a stretch canvas more. So that was nice with it. It brings out the darks and the greens. And then this is a silver with just a little green on both edges. And I thought that was nice with it. So Liz, do you have any questions? Uh, I don't think so. I like that last one, I think. It, uh, it looks <laughs> nice, it's sort of, and I think the picture is probably, the painting's probably a little closer to the, your iPad. It's sort of, oh, it's not quite as um, yellowy as, as it shows on the print, so. Okay. Sort of, yeah. okay. These all work with that too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, so uh, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, when we can get out, I'd love to come and visit you in your shop. I tend oh. to. I've been, I've been buying cheap frames in Blix, and you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I'm so. here every day. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> can you um, just remind me where were you located? It's twenty nine thirty eight North Clark. Okay. Thanks. But I have to work by appointment now yeah. because having right. the door locked. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So you can reach me on my cell, and but I do check messages here at the shop every day too. Um, but anyway, the frame you like comes in three different widths. So this is the narrow one. So you know, for larger pieces or if you like bigger frames, it, it comes in three different widths. Mary, you had a question. Yeah, you just said something again, really interesting. You said that uh, to make it more look more like a stretch canvas. Uh -huh. So is a stretch canvas, is there a perception that that's um, a better painting or a better, you know, that has a richer feel to it or something? Some people might think that. I don't know. Um, I, I like to work on panels. I like to, I dry mount canvas to gator board often, um, which is very, very rigid foam board that doesn't warp. Um, so it's thin. It's, it's thicker than a, a panel that you buy, but it's, it's still very thin. And sometimes I'll I'll put a, an oil in a deeper frame just to give the illusion of stretcher bars. When you dry mount the canvas to gatorboard, do you use the spray or what do you use for that? A dry mount is a, a big press mm. and um, I use archival tissue that is heat activated. So you put it in the press and it it just melts it, bonds it to the surface. It is reversible because it's archival. But it's a and but if you, you can big you press, can, but you buy the pads of canvas, is there a way to do that? What about the the pads of canvas that you know they're basically in a pad of ten pieces of yeah. canvas? Yes. And so you, is that your dry mount or can you glue it? You could use the three M spray or Miracle Muck. Um, there's probably a lot of other glue products out there. I I haven't researched them because I just have the dry mount press, but I have used um the 3M spray, I, I take it to my workshops to share with students to mount um, their pastel paper, but it works for canvas too. Okay, anything else? Move on? Move on. Okay. Got my trusty helper over here, really helping me <laughs> move this along. You say there is something called miracle muck? 
It's called Miracle Muck. I, I assume it's still on the market. I used it years ago. Um, and and I've used it to uh, to resurface a linen liner that's gotten stained. Um, you can brush it on and then just put it a whole new fabric on the linen liner, but that's a whole other story, so I won't get into that. This is this one. Uh, this is Christine. Huska? Yeah, Huska. She. I know she's not on. <laughs> yep. Oh. Well, this this has a real elegant feel. Um, whoops, and I need a liner from a previous linen liner. There's a yellowish, yellowy one. Um, okay, sorry. I, I'll wait on that one. Um, okay, so here's the one of the bigger versions of that silver frame with the little green on either side. I thought this was very nice with this piece. So I, I don't know without Christine here if this is really that indigo blue or if it's more of the slight gray. It's, it's just hard to tell. But I did pull a frame that is kind of the slate and indigo combination for just a simple treatment. It's uh, 14 and a half by 10, so it's not a very big team. And then, okay, thank you. Yeah. And then um, I thought this was a real elegant way to do it and inexpensive way to do it. And this really pops that building out. It's the creamy linen liner with the model gold frame. And that really focuses on the center of interest. So it, it changes it from the cool to the warm. So that's a fun thing about framing is you can really push your painting one direction or another to cool or warm. Okay, any questions? That's great. This is Robin's. For some reason, hers printed out big. I, I don't know. We had trouble getting hers to show up, and then it printed large. So. Right. so I have lots of different options for this because there are so many um, ways you can go with this. You can go warm to cool to um, dark to light. Um, this is an expensive frame. It's made in Italy, but I just thought this was so cool with the modeling that's in her piece. I just thought it was a real different treatment. Mm. I don't know if you can see that, but anyway, it's just kind of fun. Um, this is a very inexpensive way to frame it. It's a nice cap um, and it brings out some of the more reddish tones. And then again, a linen liner and a cap with the dark. And this is a nice inexpensive frame. And it, it's, I use this all the time for my work. It's just, it comes in silver, gold, and black, like, you know, the ready made frames do. But, and this is a very, very warm um, rubbed black. It's not a solid black. So Robin, do you have any questions? Okay. This is a pastel. art, which is um, nice sanded paper. It's Julie's. 
So again, uh, I don't know, it doesn't look like this is mounted, but I see a little curve. Um, so the, the pastel would go into the liner. Glass would go on top of that. So the glass would come out to the edge and then the cap would go outside. And that, that keeps the, the pastel off the glass. Checks it. And the liner could be used with any of these frames or not. You know, you could just use spacers and glass. And the color of these frames really pulls out the color of the trees and this warmth in here. So I didn't want to use anything that was very dark or harsh because it's it's a, a soft painting. Not that she painted it in a soft manner, it's just the subject matter is nice and soft and um, anything too heavy or harsh would overwhelm it. So just natural looking model patinas. Any questions? No, thanks. Okay. Okay, this is an oil and panel 1216 Shannon. We saw this yesterday. It's a nice piece. So, so many ways you can go with this. Um, I think it's bluebells or something. So, I found a silver that has a, a bluish cast. Simple treatment, but it keeps it keeps your eye on the art and not on the frame. This brings in some of that warm glow with the gold fillet that's built into the frame, and the black's not right next to the painting, so the the black really works with this. Does somebody have? Does somebody have their, uh, or could somebody mute? Is there a lot it of crash? It's probably us with all the frame samples. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, and then just a, a very, switch. very warm um, gold that's, that's not brassy. It's just a, a nice mellow gold. Oh, oh. Whoop. where'd you go? Well, hmm. Sorry, I, I must have missed loading that one. So, any questions? I love the alternatives in that one. Yeah, but it, there's really lots of ways you can go with that. So this is a um, canvas that is not mounted. So I, I imagine um, Dorothy's going to wrap this terracotta or salmon color around a board or around stretcher bars. So um, that's really not part of the painting, I don't believe. So this has a real classic old world feel. So I, I pulled some a frame or two like that. I thought this was really beautiful with it. It's a, a slightly burled wood, just very classic. And the the silver is is a very muted silver, so it, it doesn't like pop off or be too harsh or glaring. But it brings out some of this wood brick rack that's, that's on the building. This is just a simple, clean frame that's very contemporary, and it has a, a silver bevel. 
thought that was nicer, but if you'd like a clean look. And then this is a very inexpensive frame. And I think it, it pulls out some of the nice darks without without being a black frame. It's it's a mottled brown with a little bit of bronze. So any questions? No, thank you. And Dorothy, how do you mount your canvas? Do you I don't know. This is my first experience with oh. this. Okay. So. I was not sure whether to use your dry mount technique or to wrap it across some canvas. I, I wasn't sure. Well, it looks like you don't have, uh, looks like it's ripped a little short here, a little shy, uh, mm -hmm. like the tattered edge of the canvas. So I think stretching it might be difficult because you, you have to have enough salvage to be able to stretch it around the bars. Um, mm -hmm. I think you could maybe use the 3M spray and just mount it to um, a piece of acid-free foam board because it's not very big. Um, if you use foam board and anything very big, it can warp over time. But if you're going to frame it, um, the, the frame will keep it stable, keep it working. Is the 3M spray archival? Are you talking about 77 spray? Maybe. That might be, I, I don't know. Not I think, spray mount. I think Miracle Muck is archival. Miracle Muck, okay. It's archival. And to, so you don't sacrifice any of your painting. I would make your board come out here a little bit so that that salmon color fits in under the lip of the frame. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it, 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 it'll go, it'll cover just a teeny bit of the painting. Yeah, try not to cover much of the painting. So come out here with your board so that you're Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Covering into your image. Because that's right. covered into your image. You're going to just have a sliver of window and it's going right. to cover you hot. Right. Cover here, so yeah, work out here. Thank you. Uh huh. I think I'm going to come in and see you so we can talk about this because I need to. Oh, great. So maybe I'll have you help me frame one. Does it, anybody want my cell phone number? We can send it out. Okay. Nancy, you mentioned. Um, the thought of, of about a contemporary frame um, is a. Do you choose a contemporary frame uh, because of the subject or because of why? Why? Why one type of frame? Uh, with hers, I prefer a more classic frame because of the subject. But you know, some people have just gone so sleek in their interior design that um, a classic frame doesn't work so you can if you're careful with choosing a contemporary frame you can you know bring a, a classic image into a contemporary setting I think by the, your choice of frame does that make sense okay I have to say your microphone is really good picking up every sound <laughs> oh Ron, yeah maybe we shouldn't put them away <laughs> okay we have okay. Sorry. Oops. Okay, here's another one I didn't get loaded. I'm sorry. Um these kept coming in in bits and spots and I I thought I got most of them, but I guess I missed some. Okay, this is um, a nine by uh, oh, I'm sorry, a nine by five sketch on half of a nine by twelve canvas board. So she cut it down. So it's it's a little guy. Um, okay, um, I did, I I was thinking it was nine by twelve. So these might be a little 
big for it. But I thought this soft gold patina, it's such a, a classic landscape. I, I thought this was really beautiful with it. It's it looks really grassy online, but it's it's a very soft, soft patina. It has a lot of um, warm clay rubbed into it, so it it isn't grassy and shiny. Um, I thought the wood tone was nice with it. This is a slightly burled wood veneer. Goes well with this. Huh? Who's it, is this? Uh, it is uh, Linda Brown. And she said something about um, when she cut it, the edge was. Uh, Linda, are you there? Yes, Nancy, thank you. Oh. So the tricky part about this, I never intended to frame it, it was just a sketch, but. If I cut the board, I've got this really raw edge that you would never want to see. And so that has to be covered up. And I didn't know how you could frame something like that. Well, all frames have a little lip unless it's a reveal frame. So that's going to cover and tuck that rough edge in under. So any traditional frame has that. It's called a rabbit. Or any traditional frame has that rabbit. Um, and you said something about glass, and this I is a, want to use glass, but I couldn't figure out a way other than matting with glass. So I'm thrilled that you don't have to use glass in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I with an oil, I wouldn't use glass. Um, right. This one, this frame, I thought was beautiful with the color here, and again, it's very contemporary. If you like clean lines, so you've got a a classic, a natural, and then a contemporary. Um, option with these three. Great. I'd love to bring it into you and we can go Thanks. out. Thank you. Right. We probably have 15 minutes or so. Oh, okay. That was number 20. You're, you're doing great. Okay. <laughs> this is Anne's. So, I thought this classic silver was really pretty with it. It kind of goes with the, the foreground and, and the silvery patina on the foliage. And then uh, white frames are actually very popular now. Um, a couple of summers ago, I was walking around New York and every single frame shop I saw had white frames in the window. So anyway, uh, we're always behind New York, but I have been using white frames more. Um, so I thought this was nice with it. It's, um, it's a rubbed white and has just a little silver edge, which I thought spoke to the, the metal in the foreground. Mm. And it's it's kind of the similar rub to the patina that's on the urn, and then um, just a, a clean contemporary look, white linen liner, and then this matches the shovel, the metallic to the shovel. So it it depends on what you want the viewer to focus on. So you know these I think these two are. Are really a feminine approach, and this is more masculine. So, any questions, Anne? I, I don't think she's here. She's not here. Okay. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, a nocturne. This is Andrea's, and she said that. She doesn't like black frames. She likes silver or gold. But I'm trying to change her mind <laughs> because I don't I don't see silver or gold with this subject because it's uh, it's beautifully painted. I love it. Um, 
it's just, it's a casual subject and lots of color. So I, I thought it needed some warm tones, but still keep it dark because it is a nocturne. I thought this was fun with it. It's kind of a rubbed grayed brown and then the burl, which speaks to the, the warm orangey and red tones. It's probably in the way. And I liked this with it. It's a very soft black and then it has those warm wooden orange tones on the outer edge. If you like a, a larger presentation, how big is the piece? Oops, oh, you're muted. It's 12 by 16, Nance. Okay. okay. Do, you, do you think one of those inserts would work that you were suggesting? You had some wood um, fillets? So with a uh, frame to offset the black. Whenever I put a black, gold, or silver right next to any nocturnes that I do, it just doesn't, it pulls all the darks out of my painting and you miss some of the nuances of the uh, value shifts. And that's where I'm at a, I, I'm puzzled on what to go with. That's why I was curious about these fillets you were suggesting. Well, the, the fillets are, uh, There's not really color in the fillets there, other than wood tones, silver, and gold. But they can bring out some color, some of mm -hmm. your yellows. Um, that blue linen that you had, I know I work in oil, uh, so you'd have to be extra, extra cautious on smudging it. Uh, it had like a different kind of a uh, value that seemed interesting or complements maybe something that's midnight or nocturnal. The, the car is... Mm -hmm. Okay, let me go grab that. Yes, yeah, kind of curious. I found it. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe with another frame, this blue could work. Right. Okay. Yeah, I don't really like it with that. Mm -hmm. That's better. Yeah, that is nice. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then just, if you just need like a simple thing, um, you know, this has copper. It's very narrow, and we have this in a lot of different thickness or widths. So the, the copper might give you a little spark of color if you need to use it, a dark frame. All right, thank you, Nancy. Uh. Okay, Kim. Okay, this has such a nice um, rosy glow to it. So I, I wanted to get one to play up the brown and also play up the, the rosy tones. So it's a, a very classic city scene, uh, European scene. But I thought this really gorgeous frame with traditional detail was pretty with it. It has a lot of roll and um, detail on the outer edge. It just seemed to go nicely with it. Because I think there's a lot of interest in there and I don't I don't think this fights with that too much. Sometimes detail can really fight with a, an image, but I don't think that does so much. And then something simpler but still classic is linen liner and a wooden frame that that brings up the browns. Mm -hmm. And then this is very 
casual and fun. Um, kind of a rosy tone. It's a little rustic and it's inexpensive. So nice. Yeah, I like the first one though. That is really pretty. Isn't that a pretty frame? Yeah, that's a beautiful one. But you know, anything can use a linen liner. Um, you can add fillets, you know, dress them up. Um, can't really dress them down, but we can, we've got lots of choices to, um, you know, if, if none of these work, we certainly have something that, that would, would work. So any questions before Ron talks about prints? <laughs> Thank you. You know, somebody did have one question for you, um, and okay. that was about um, how to um, uh, work with a D-ring and uh, how do you wire the back? Oh, okay. So the D-ring, of course, you have to determine the orientation of your painting. <laughs> so you don't want to put your wire on and then realize you hung it upside down. So um, find the orientation of your painting if it's a vertical. This is attached to the edge and probably you'll be working smaller. So you really just need a D ring with a single screw hole. Then you just screw in the screw and the wire is run between, you need one on each side. The wire is run between the two. Give yourself uh, maybe extra three or four inches of salvage of the wire and then you just wrap it tightly around itself so that locks the is there a trick to that or do you double over or anything double you can double knot it yes yeah. so you run it you run it through once and you can run it through again and then just do a tight wind um, just a tight wind like that. So that, that's double wrapped and wound. So it's not gonna go anywhere. And where do you put that on the painting? Um, try not to get it too low because your painting will hang out away from the wall. So get it, you know. Top the, third of the painting? I'd say top thirds, top quarter. You just wanna make sure that when you pull on it, that it doesn't extend up above your painting. And a lot of people use hooks. So give it a little room for a hook that's on the wall so that you can't see the top of the hook sticking up above your frame. So how do you get that tight wrap there? Well, you just, you run the wire through both of the D rings and then just pull it. But I mean the, where you wrapped it around the wire, the wire around the wire, I uh -huh. think it's that tight. You just, just wrap it. Just keep wrapping yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Okay. The other the other trick I learned. It's so neat. That's mine. Don't look so neat. <laughs> well, mine don't either. <laughs> we have three great employees that can really wrap the wire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the trick I learned was always with the same size pieces to try to hang that as close to the same distance for every single painting, um, if you can. Because that, yeah. that, that, then that way, when you're lining them up on the wall, that they will line up uh, yeah. even it's a lot easier to hang. Yeah, with with clients that bring in several pieces at once, we measure down and measure from the top of the frame where the wire comes across, and yeah, we try to make it as simple as possible for them when they're hanging. Any more framing questions? Nancy, thank you so much. Oh, thank you guys for submitting. And we thought there were going to be 10 and we had so many. That's great. So it's fun to see all the pieces. Thank you. You're going to give thank your you. phone number to Mary. What's that? You're going to give oh, your phone number to Mary. cell number is 773-458-3000. And that's seven days a week, and uh, you can call up till 10 p.m. Great, thanks. Uh -huh. I'm sending out a note a little later with all this uh, tomorrow morning. Um, thanks, all thanks, of this. Let me 
Send this out of your way. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. And thanks, Virginia. <laughs> okay. Here's Ron. Can you see me? Uh, let me. He's not going to be using the board, so I'm going to tilt this up. Oh, that's great. You can see him better. Oops. Okay, maybe I'll just hold it. Okay. That's okay. I'm Ron, uh, Nancy's husband. Been with the with her for 45 years, and I do two things. I make a lot of noise in the background, which I just showed to you guys earlier. And I also, what I do is I photograph her work and I edit it and I publish it. And uh, I had given a, a, a PDF file to uh, uh, Mary last night. Thank you, Mary, for all your help on this this adventure. And, and I think she's gonna distribute it later. Now, I will tell you this, I didn't know exactly what all you wanted to know about the photo photography and the editing and the publishing. So you, you may look at that and say, what what is he talking about a Hasselblad camera and stuff like that when I'm not gonna spend $50,000 for one. But um, there's really three three aspects to the capture process and pu publishing. It's, it's, it's the capture, it's the editing, and it's the publishing. And I say publishing because publishing can be either uh, on screen, uh, like internet, that type of thing, or it can be uh, printing it. And uh, I guess as far as I don't know how many people are left, and I'd be interested in if I could get some feedback from you real quickly, what what all is it you're interested in really starting at the, the publishing end? At, are, are you going to be doing simple prints? Are you going to be uh, like cards and things like that? Or are you going to be doing uh, G Clay prints? Or are you going to be doing publishing on the website or Facebook or that? Yeah, and then um, I think for this, I, 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 I think um, you probably might want to do a little bit of each of those kinds of things. Just talk about that if there's some way, but I think all of those are going to be across. There's 20 people left right now. It could be any of those, but if you can just kind of give us basics of those and then um, people can talk to you some more afterward. Okay. Well, the main thing is uh, being able to capture the image in the first place. And uh, the good news is things just keep getting better and better and better all the time. Uh, I've been working with digital cameras since 1987, and believe me, they're a lot better now than they used to be. But now you can uh, actually capture images on, uh, oh, you, look, Mary's put that up there. Capture images on uh, cell phones and on uh, things like iPads, and they do a very, very good job. In fact, just recently we got Nancy an Apple phone, which we'd never had before, and she got a well, recently uh, a newer iPad, and the, the quality of the images they take are just fantastic. So the, the thing is about those, though, just real quickly, is they take images at most of them at 72 dots per inch, which means if you took a square inch of the image, there'd be 72 dots by 72 dots. That is great for publishing on uh, on the internet, Facebook, Instagram, that type of website. thing. Website, put them on your website, that sort of thing. Uh, and the they also record, almost all of them record them in RGB, which is, stands for red, green, and blue, which is the color, what they call the color space. Now that, that there again, that's perfect for all the visual things uh, that, that you would see on a screen, whether they're again be a website or Instagram or Facebook, whatever. But uh, now, if you're going to start printing them, you need to get them to a much higher resolution, uh, up to 300 dots per inch. And when you do print them, they're going to be printed in the color space, not RGB, but CMYK. Now, a, a lot of this is, is lightly described in the, the handout that Mary's going to give you. And there again, if you have questions about this, I know it can be kind of mind boggling back and forth. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to call me and I'll be, I'll be happy to explain those things. So if you take a, a really good photograph of your painting and you take it with a cell phone or say an iPad, this is not, this is not talking about cameras yet, but, uh, and you, you have it at 72 dot per inch in RGB, how do you get it, how do you get it transferred up to 300 dots per inch and CMYK? Well, mostly that's done with software, such as 
Photoshop or Photoshop elements. We'll talk about that in a minute also. So um, it's according to what you're going to do. And if you're going to publish these prints, how large you're going to, to print them. But the, one of the main things to remember is when you're photographing your image with a cell phone or with an iPad is to get it as square as possible. By that I mean photograph it possibly on the ground and square your camera up as much as possible because you're going to have to, there is software in the cell phones and on your iPad or whatever uh, unit you're using they, to edit it. But it's, if, it's, if you take it like this and it's perfectly square, it's pretty easy to work with. But if you got it like that, then the bottom's big, the top's small, you have to rearrange it and all that sort of thing. So try to square your camera up as much as possible. And there again, uh, the main thing also is to get it so you're not, if you're, you're shooting it outside and on the ground, in the sun, and if you're an oil painter, particularly oil painters, there'll be reflection back because it's fairly fresh oil paint. So you wanna make sure that it's covered it's in the shadows to some extent. So take it and put it, you know, go to the side of a building, lean over it so that it's completely covered by your body or whatever, square it up and shoot your camera or your iPad that way. And uh, that'll save you a lot of headaches down the road because if uh, I, in fact, I don't shoot, she does, uh, Nancy does oils and pastels and I shoot everything in the shadows because uh, you can always bring software, you can bring the colors back out and everything. But if it's blown out, by that I mean the whites are just blown out, and what they call blown out, it just they flash. Uh, you can't you can't get any color out of them, or yellows particularly. Uh, then you have a problem. So there again, if you're going to shoot with a cell phone or with an iPad. Make sure that uh, you, you you have a fairly a new uh, unit. Uh, I mean, if you have an iPad that's seven years old, it's not going to be that that great. If you have a camera that's seven years old, it's not going to be that great. But the new technology is really something. And I, you notice that I'm not mentioning Samsung and some of the other cameras. It's just because I'm not familiar with them. So you might want, if you are going to upgrade your camera or, or your cell phone or whatever, you might want to check with what the current technology is. But uh, as I say, Nancy's now on both on Apple both on the iPad and the cell phone, and we're very, very pleased with it. In fact, she has been taking pictures and she can instantly, on the iPad or her cell phone, she can edit them, square them up, adjust the colors if necessary, sharpen the image, and she publishes right it out to the uh, either Facebook or out to her website right away. It used to be they had to go through me and go downstairs, and I had to do all the editing and cleanup and that sort of thing, but now she can do that because the technology is that advanced. So um, you'll notice on the handout that uh, Mary's gonna send you to, if you're gonna do things with a camera, that's a kind of a different issue. There are various levels of cameras from 250 to $50,000, literally. And I, I can't, quite frankly, I'm not gonna imagine that uh, some people here are interested in spending $50,000 for a Hasselblad digital back camera. It's a just, it's an amazing device. But to be honest with you, I had always dreamed of having a camera like that until I found out that I could get them, get those, my, any images I needed shot at cut for probably a hundred bucks <laughs> and, and the, get the image out. But um, so just pick, if you are gonna pick a camera, I would suggest something probably in the mid range, uh, in the a thousand to $2,000 range. I happen to shoot Canon, I always have, but there's, a, you know, there's Fuji, there's uh, uh, Nikon, there's a number of great manufacturers. I, I list some, and if you say, if you look at that list and you say, well, I know a great camera that's not on that list, well, it's just, I, there was no room to list them all. So, so the equipment first, and then being able to shoot, and there's a list of the things that you may want to consider in there, and they call the camera capture, capture is not only just the camera, but uh, if you're going to photograph, uh, your artwork, you should have a very sturdy easel to put it on. Um, and you should also should have a very sturdy tripod to have the camera on. Because if you just stand there and try to square it up yourself and take a picture, you'll get something, but it's not gonna be good enough to uh, really print good 
strong or good sized prints. And the other thing is also, if you're going to have a camera on a sturdy uh, tripod, there's a thing called a remote trigger, which means that you're not holding the camera, you're not pressing down the button because I don't care how uh, you good you are, you is pushing down that button just shakes it a little bit. But a remote tr trigger is a fairly inexpensive device. It's just a wire that hooks to your camera. You can push a button and it will shoot the picture and there won't be any shaking to it at all. So that's what that refers there to. Then as far as editing goes, it's just a matter of uh, what kind of software you want to do. If you're going to, uh, first of all, understand why, you're, why you are editing. If you're just going to publish uh, again on uh, Facebook, Instagram, website, that sort of thing, you can probably do that in your, your camera or your iPad. But if you want to do larger uh, things as prints, eight by 10s, 11 by 14s, 12 by 16s, that sort of thing, then you probably want to bring it in and do a number of things. First of all, you want to get it all completely squared up and, and, and cut, cut into the exact image at the size of it. Then you want to adjust the colors, which is a very important thing. Uh, because I don't care, I've never seen a camera yet that was able to uh, take the colors exactly as they are, whether, and that, that has a lot to do with lighting equipment also, whether you're shooting outside in the sun or shooting inside with lights and things like that. So you're going to inevitably adjust the colors. And then the uh, that last thing you're going to do is to, uh, to resize it and square it up and get it uh, into the size that you need to print it at. That brings us kind of to our last area, which is the, the printing area. And I, I realize I'm going through this rather quickly, but uh, there again, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Well, let me say one thing, step, stepping back as far as editing goes. Uh, a very popular, very wonderful program is known as Adobe Photoshop. Uh, I have Adobe Photoshop and I have since the year 2000 and it's way, way, way more than what I need. I maybe use 12% of Photoshop, but I just, it's what I got started on and I'm still on. They also have a, a, a smaller product called Photoshop Elements. Uh, Photoshop costs about, um, well, if you buy it out directly, it's about $600. If you buy Photoshop Elements, it's about $75 or $80, something like that. And it'll do everything you need to do. Um, and uh, I remember when I first got Photoshop, I started wandering off into all the functions and thought, boy, am I going to have a great time. And then I had to sober up and say to myself, yeah, you're going to have a great time and get lost in this and never come back. So it's just a matter of uh, I just stick to very few functions within Photoshop and I keep my eye on the ball of what I'm doing. So that uh, there are other editing products, but uh, I would uh, definitely recommend that you take a look at the Adobe Photo Elements uh, as far as an editing product, if that's uh, the way you're gonna go. Um, and then it come, comes down to, to printing. Uh, there's according to what you're going to print. Uh, for instance, if you're just gonna print, we print uh, around here, we have a lot of cards. Am I showing this right? It's upside down. Oh, upside down, right? <laughs> we print a lot of cards, uh, greeting cards that people can purchase in the store. And I print those on a desktop printer, just a regular type printer um, that you'd have hooked to your desktop just to do work. And it has, uh, it only has four colors in it, the CYMK, which again is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And there's a reference at the very end of the document so you can remember what those colors are. It's there again, if you're going to publish to a screen, you're gonna use RGB, red, green, and blue. If you're gonna print it, it should be in CYMK. And there should be a way to convert that over. And there's an, any number of products that will do that. And especially there again, if you, you look at uh, Adobe Photoshop Elements, it can do that very easily. So, uh, but the, you could, there again, you could do it in a nice desktop printer. I mean, our cards are, are $5, uh, so I don't know, feel like I need to go to the archival route. But now when I do prints, I do all archival G-Clay prints. And that, that's a completely different ball game. 
Uh, first of all, I'll talk about gicler. That gicler is the French word for to spray. It means that the, it really refers to the fact that they're using inkjet printers. In the old days, they had four color separation and seriographs and lithographs and all that sort of stuff. But now everything's done on inkjet printers, which spray the ink on. So that's what gicler means. So a lot of people say that they have, a, here's an EG clay print, and that's supposed to trigger in your mind that it's also archival. But actually, I, mean, I could say that my cards are G clay prints because they're printed with an uh, inkjet printer. So I always say it's archival G clay, which means that I use a uh, special paper. I have a Epson printer, 24 inch wide printer uh, that uses archival inks. Now, I mentioned earlier that your desktop has four colors in the CYMK. The 24-inch uh, printer I have has 11 inks in it, different colors. And it is, um, is there again, they're all archival. I use it only Epson archival inks. And I don't mess around trying different combinations. Um, and uh, also I use archival, specific archival papers particularly the papers being like uh, Hanamule Photo Rag 308 and uh, Hanamule Canvas. They're very nice papers, very well worth the price and everything. So the difference being is a ink that is in your desktop printer is a dye-based ink. It's like like you want a blue jeans, you have to dye the blue in the, in the, in the cloth and it goes into the cloth and it's blue. Okay. The, the inks that are in an uh, archival printer are pigment inks, which means it's, what it is is it's colors that are ground up extremely, extremely fine and put in a solution. And then it's printed on a archival paper, which is chemically treated to accept that ink. And the two of them bond together. And uh, pigment inks, they're, they're extremely, they're very beautiful, very well done, but the only problem is they sit on the surface of the paper. So when you're done with the print, you can't treat it roughly because just, just a thumb scratch on it will scratch the ink until you treat it with some sort of coating or you put it under, under glass. Uh, now, they, not only do we print on archival papers, we also print on archival canvas. And when it's printed on canvas, then we use an archival spray and I've noted a couple of names of in the uh, handout that you'll receive, but there are there again there's a lot of different companies uh, that you know have archival sprays to put on canvas prints, and then here again if it's on paper then it usually goes under glass when it's framed to protect it. So, um, I let's see. Uh, I don't know if there's really anything else that I could share in this short time. There again we could talk for a long long time about the whole process and, and what it takes to do it. But um, I, I would ask uh, if you have questions. What kind of a mount, how do you mount an iPhone to a tripod? Um, well, that's kind of Buy interesting. <laughs> well, we, I, I don't know how you would do, uh, you would probably just clip it on with uh, some, like big binder clips or something like that. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we've been experimenting with Nancy trying to do some videos for her. And uh, we've, we, I don't know if we've done the phone yet, have we? No, we just use the iPad. We've used the iPad for that. We just on clip it on, on an easel. Yeah, an easel. Well, this one here. On uh, the easel that, that this is mounted on right here. And I don't know exactly, I don't know if there, you could do some research to see if there's somebody that makes some sort of jig that would hold it on. Oh, I, oh. I have one. Oh. What is it? So I have one that, uh, it's just called a Cobra Tech, but I actually haven't used it, but it just goes right on the, um, on the tripod. A lot of people use uh, their phones and iPads to paint from in workshops and they clip them on their, on their, uh, paint tripod could you hold that up again please oh sure let me uh cobra oh. it's yeah this is called cobra tech okay cobra tech. okay well that uh 
attaches it. Yeah, it just attaches it. Okay. So I say we just got started in doing this, and we've just been kind of leaning up there and adjusting it so it was catching Nancy's image properly. So, um, so that's. But you could also use that to take uh, photographs of, of images. And there again, if you're not printing a, above an eight by ten, or might you might even get away with an eleven by fourteen. Uh, probably would get by without having to bring it onto a computer and using the 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 software. And then there again, the Photo Elements, Adobe Photo Elements is, is relatively inexpensive, but there's a learning curve. I mean, you're into a whole new world of, of what what is all this stuff and why why is it on here? And what, what, which components should I use? Which ones don't really apply to me? So there's a little bit of a learning curve more, more which is probably more important than really the cost. So, I've got a quick question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go I've ahead. Got a quick um, do you treat the paper that you use for your greeting cards? No, actually, it's uh, it's a, it's made. Strathmore. It's made by Strathmore, and it's called a textured, deckled edge, which means I'll take this card out to show you. Um, it's kind of a, it's just a nice paper. It's, it has a texture to it, it's deckled edge, which means, deckled edge means it's got a torn edge, which gives it kind of a classy look. And also the envelope itself has a torn edge also. So it's kind of nice looking, it's acid free paper. So uh, actually I don't advertise it this way at all, but uh, probably these prints would last a long time if, if, as cards, if you didn't put them, and, and, and no, no print, whether it's a card or whether it's an archival G clay print, should you put in direct sunlight? It should be away, you know, angled away from the direct sun. But uh, it is there again, uh, Strathmore, um, and just deckled edge. And I get it from a place called Jerry's Artorama. Great, thank you. Other questions? We're having some attrition here. Uh, so I, um, I think we're probably close to done here. I, I don't see any other questions here. Okay. I would say that Ron will print for other artists. So he doesn't just yeah. do my work. And um, there's a whole pricing structure that is reduced for artists. Well, I, I got, actually I'll photograph and edit and print. So. And just according any or if you have the uh, images all ready to go and you just need to print it, I will print it. You know, so work with you in any way. And uh, I know I know it, I went through that rather quickly, but I figured people were probably starting to get a little burnt out here toward the end. So you covered so much ground. So thank you, and and uh, that was terrific. And I will send out the uh, handouts tomorrow. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Anybody has questions? <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank both of you. This was great. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.